Hi, everybody. Welcome. I'm so excited today to have Jane Christoffi with us from Right Track Educational Services. And Jane and I go way back when our kid, her second child and my first child were very little. We were in the same mom's group. And um, Jane is here to talk to us today about helicopter parenting. I'm super excited. And um, Jane has over 25 years experience as an educator, a teacher, a guidance counselor, an educational strategist. What else can you tell us about you, Jane? Well, I have a business called Right Track, you've mentioned. Uh, I help students transition from one school to the next, from one stage to the next. I help them find their academic direction, their passions, their strengths. And um, I also help kids build their study skills, learn skills, and real life skills. Okay, and that's I what I... Mostly with tweens and teens, and I love it. It's really fun work. Amazing. And even like kind of learning how to study for an exam, that yep. kind of thing? Okay. Yeah, very important skills. Yes. Skills more than the content, for sure. Yes. Okay. And I find that um, my kids have said to me before, mom, back off, you're being a helicopter mom. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about what you know about all this. Well, helicopter parenting is our style of parenting right now. It's the trend. Okay. It's also called snowplow and kind of um, versions, variations of the helicopter parent. But helicopter parents were, that was a term that was coined in the 1990s, early 90s. And it was, okay. uh, actually, I have a definition here. A parent who hovers over a child in a way that runs counter to the parent's responsibility to raise a child to independence. Ooh. So you're sort of taking over their ability to grow into the person that they should be or are going to be. Um, and it really was a term that came about with the generation called the millennials. Okay. Mm -hmm. So millennials were born in the early eighties and their moms uh, were going back to work in droves. So the activities that kind of resulted from moms going back to work, um, that impacted the way they were as young adults. So for example, uh, the play date was formed. Yes. Moms were at work. They still wanted their kids to be involved in play. And so they would organize play dates for after work and they would be at them. So kids normally would, you know, play. Kids are not supposed to have parents or teachers around. It's supposed to be totally choice, unstructured. All of a sudden their parents are running it and they're observing, and they're evaluating, and they're comparing. <laughs> yes. Yeah, this is what happened. So also parents would swoop in and solve the problem whenever there was a conflict or if someone fell or if you know, saving the day for the kids. And so as a result, kids kind of have grown up with a warped attitude and uh warped way and um not enough responsibility has been expected of them or asked of them. Um and they're just not they they haven't shown enough skills to show that they're ready to launch and as a result many kids are flunking out of college or transferring out coming home uh and they're just not ready to launch so helicopter parenting and there's a lot of mental health parts to it i mean i could go on but okay basically what i know is i don't want to be a helicopter parent <laughs> like and that's really where i think this can be helpful for us is to say like well what what is it that we can do to allow our kids, because there is this need to be involved and, you know, not solve their problems necessarily, which seems to be taking it to the next level, but definitely know where they are and what they're doing. And I think it comes from a lot of anxiety in parents. Like yeah. they want to have, tra take charge and they want to know how to help their kid. And that if they're not doing it, they think they're doing something wrong. Yeah. So that's another piece of the helicopter parenting that started back in the 80s. So there were a bunch of abductions that happened in the 80s. So this fear came about that we constantly have to pay attention to our kids. There were high profile accidents that happened at playgrounds. So playgrounds, these are American stories. So that the, um, the abductions piece, there was a little boy's face on the side of um, milk cartons. And then yes. who's most wanted, that show came about in the 80s by the dad of, a boy that was famously 
conducted. Anyway, there's another piece about academics. In the States, the academics were falling behind the American kids. So they were freaking out about school too. So there's all of a sudden this emphasis on academics and keeping up. So parents are going crazy for all of these reasons. Yes. And they want their kids to be successful in ways that they felt were important. So there was less emphasis on things like chores. And um, parents sort of believed, well, we're going to do it for you so that you can focus on getting your grade eight violin or be a triple A hockey player or something like that. Gotcha. Yeah. So helicopter parenting uh, had to do with safety, but it had to do with academics and being an overachiever. There were tons of pieces that created these kids that were just overwhelmed and kind of paralyzed by the time they became adults. They weren't able to make decisions for themselves because mom and dad had done so many for them. And Do you feel like it's swinging back a little bit the other way now? Well, free range parenting is another controversial style that came about with a story out of New York City when a family allowed their kid to go on the subway at the age of nine or something. Yes. Uh, so that would be the other end of the pendulum. Okay. Uh, I think it's still on the helicopter side. Okay. I really do. Yeah. That's how, <laughs> how can we prevent it? Okay, well, there's lots of, I think the most important thing to prevent helicopter parenting is just being aware of your parenting style. Pay attention to what comes out of your mouth. And I'm like, I'm talking to myself, not just your viewers and, and your network, Carolyn, because yes. I came across this material over the last few years, everything I read, I can't, like I'm looking at my own parenting style and I'm tweaking it. I'm trying to be really self-aware and uh, make changes for my kids' benefit, you know? Yes. And so I just, I'm trying to just zip it up and let them figure things out, let them solve problems. Um, I'm trying to step back, let them mm -hmm. make decisions. And Even just I stuff like going, like going out and going for a walk around the block. Yes. <laughs> this is stuff that parents don't really want their kids to do. Walk the dog, go to the grocery store to pick up an ingredient, ride your bike and get it for me because I need it. Mm -hmm. Or walk home from the bus stop or take the bus. Yes. You know, instead it's picking up and dropping off everywhere. It's crazy. Yes. Okay. So it can really go both ways. I forgot to mention that you're a mom of two as well. Yes. So yeah, it is like... I have, I have teenagers and I have tips for parents along the way. Like whatever stage you're at, you can start where you are to become aware of your parenting style and less of a helicopter, lawnmower, snowplow, if that's the type of parenting style you're exhibiting. <laughs> I'm not judging because... I think it's just part of our time, you know? Okay. Yes. But why do we want to not do that? I mean, I think I've heard you say a couple of things. We want kids to take responsibility for themselves. We want them to be able to launch. We want them to be able to know how to manage their, their mental health. Right. Yeah. Um, I think just, um, we want to encourage self-efficacy in our kids, which is a belief in one's own capabilities. Okay. So, confidence in in themselves that they are capable of making decisions that they're they don't need mom and dad's approval you know um they can figure something out the other night my daughter had dance class and as i mentioned i've got two teenagers and my son had a nearby hockey practice and so um with the timing she drove him to the hockey practice and back it just happened to be in the same end of town in the same interval of time so she got to the parking lot to pick him up it was about 10 15 so dark not the nicest parking lot to be in if you're an almost 18 year old girl in a dance leotard and the car died so the two of them had to figure it out she texted me and she said mom like the car's dead and i said okay well you're gonna have to sort this out there's cables in the back and there's lots of hockey dads who are coming out of the arena and i said keep me posted I also said there's an emergency number in the glove compartment for the card people to come and help. It's yes. Included, but uh, they have to figure it out. I, you know, what am I going to do? Jump in an Uber and go do it for them? No. It's absolutely fine. Yes. And they totally, they would feel so good about themselves for figuring that out. They did. Yeah. For sure. Another area where I've noticed my kids just blossom is when, 
when they were in grade six, they started using the TTC to get to and from school. Mm -hmm. And because uh, they we, we aren't down the street from our school, both of, one's in an arts focus, one's in a French immersion. So they kind of have to transfer and do the other change. And they just feel so empowered by being in the world and um, being in charge of themselves, you know, yes. it's exciting for them. I can still reach them by phone or whatever if I need to, but I try to even back off with that. Yep. Let them, let them be. And so where I've found it with my kids is trying to get them to help around the house more yeah. so that it's not all falling on me, on my shoulders and somebody telling me to do that young and, to, and said to me like, don't wait until they're 12 for, to 14 years old to start getting them to help. Yes. There's so much research about chores and helicopter parents, we have not asked our kids to do enough. And it's because of that whole thing like, oh, Johnny needs to practice piano right now, so I'll just make his bed and walk the dog and do the things that our parents expected us to do when we were growing up. Right. Um, I think a lot of parents in our generation, we feel that they don't need, they're, they're not important, these skills and chores, mm -hmm. but it's actually really important. And there was a longitudinal study that came out recently from Harvard University. It was the longest one in the history of research on human behavior and um, it figured out the large the greatest factor contributing to success in the workplace was chores those who did the most chores were the most successful and the reason behind that is that um, people who worked hard and pitched in at home and did grunt work they're really part of a team, right? You're, yeah. Everybody's got to contribute and pull their weight. It's the same thing in a workplace. So if you anticipate what your coworker needs or what your boss needs, you may, may very well be the most successful person or the first thought of for promotion, that type of thing. There's a link between chores and success in the workplace. Amazing. And camp is a great place to have kids really become collaborative and pitch inners team players because at camp you have to there's a peer pressure to get the kindling and to pitch the tent and to you know on the canoe trip you can't be doing these lily dip paddles you've got to dig in you know yes but at home there's many chores you can start as of the age of two and i can provide a link for you carolyn for the show notes or on on this sure. page if sure. you want me um i didn't write the list but it was a list that i found and i was like because I had not my kids to do that when they were little, but it's never too late. Okay. So no matter what age you're at, like you're saying at two, what kind, what kind of things would they be doing at two? You know, I can't remember off the top of my head. I could pull okay, don't worry. right now. And since my kids are far from that, I don't have it memorized, but I'm thinking just like putting Pick up the toys. Yeah. yeah. Toys away or put your yeah. toothbrush where it goes or where do your dirty clothes go? Yeah. So that's easy. Real, mm -hmm. real basics, but you there are things on the list that are going to make some moms listening to this squirm a little bit because okay. they're going to feel comfortable because you kind of want to protect your kid. And the reality is, is so many parents in our generation as well, we love doing things for our kids. Yes. And so we kind of like nurturing them and supporting them in the way uh, that we are. And the other piece is sometimes it's really just a lot faster to just do it, do it ourselves instead of asking them and the nagging and the fighting that might go along with it. But we've got to ask them to do it. Yeah. One thing that I do with my kids is I say, look, these are the things that I need you to do this weekend. Yeah. But you decide when. Yes. You give them control over the when. Mm -hmm. And we need to provide feedback about how well the chore has been done. Like my son did some snow shoveling earlier this winter and he did a rotten job. It was really... <laughs> garbage and i said you know like i actually work from home i have clients that come to my home uh for consultations and sessions and so on i said like that's not professional for me and by the way i don't want you to do any job rotten i want everything that you do whether it's a small task at home or something important for a teacher or an employer a volunteer leader or whatever i want it to be good work i want you to value and care mm -hmm. so it's also establishing the value and uh, uh, for your work, like, are you going to do a good job, or are you just going to be that person who does the bare minimum? I don't mm, want to yeah. like 
I don't want a kid like that. And that kind of battles against this millennial thing where it's like, ah, it'll all happen, right? No, we, we can't have that. No. Um, yeah, so, so definitely um, give out the, the chores. I think we need to also role model to our kids um, that failure and setbacks are a part of life. You know, we normalize struggle in life so that they can become resilient. Right. Um, instead of swooping in and try to save them from yes. struggle, we need to let them be in it and show them that we're supporting them while they're in it. It's okay and say, look, this is normal. I had, you know, if, if let's say you have a child who's being bullied, you could talk about a situation or two that has happened in your life or maybe, you know, one that's happening. Yes. Um, so normalize struggle I think is a big one instead of saving them from it which is huge because nobody wants to see their kids in pain it's so hard yeah you need to teach them to be resilient um you know another parenting um mishap with the whole snowplow thing is parents you know trying to fix social problems or make sure their kid gets invited to everything or contact the teacher to say um, you know, what's with this mark? Or can my child have an extension? All of these things. Forget it. Stay yeah. in front of it. Yeah. It's not your place. The you kids. know, I had that happen recently where I've helped my daughter a lot because she has um, a learning disability. So I've had to have school meetings and, you know, quite a lot of going in and meeting the teacher at the beginning of the year, right? I'm where it's like, okay, this is her profile. She will let you know. And she's very good at going up and saying, no, I, I need an accommodation for this, but she's in grade eight now. So she was like, nope, no meeting this year, mom. I was like, what? Awesome. You've done your job, Carolyn. <laughs> I was panicked. No, but especially for the kids that have accommodations, those yeah. are the kids who need the voice the most. Yes. Because they have to own it. They've got to make sure that they get what they need yeah. and what they want in life. They need to be strong self-advocates. So yeah. if mom and they're doing it for them, yeah. that's the worst thing ever. I know. And as a social worker, I'm like, I just like bringing everybody to the table and I get the history teacher saying something to the French teacher. And isn't that great? I was like, I had to back out and say, you're right. You're absolutely right. This is something you can do yourself. You don't need a big meeting. You can do it as it comes up. And that's what she's done. Caroline, she, I know, but I didn't like the feeling, I Jane. You want to be involved and you That's care right. her as you care. Yeah, and, it, and also it's you know, like I'm losing grip. I'm losing my grip. Yeah, but our job as parents is to put ourselves out of a job. To put ourselves out of a job? And I got that quote from Julie Lithcott Haynes. She has a great book called How to Raise an Adult. So that was actually the first piece of work I came across that just really was eye opening. And I felt so compelled to share what I've learned since I found her book. I've found a, a handful more to, with other parents. And so I've created a, a presentation called Raising Resilient Teens or Raising Resilient Kids. And I do it in communities and to mom groups and to schools. Um, and I talk about it as, as well as some of the things that we can do to make sure our kids are ready to launch because um, helicopter parenting is getting in the way. Yeah. It's preparedness. And I love that idea that your job is to just be not, not in a job anymore or your job shifts, right? Like it really, really, really shifts as you go through the years. Yeah. Yeah. So besides chores and, and really not rescuing our kids from their mistakes, is there anything else that you can think of that would be helpful for us to know? I think you want to encourage your children to have a support network that goes beyond you. Um, you know, whether it's an aunt or a cousin or teachers, you know, think of that village. Who are other people your child can turn to if you're not available or if they need you? Um, I think making sure your child feels like they have choice, options in their life, you know, they have control over it a little bit. Yes. That will make them feel empowered. An example of that could be, you know, maybe your child is having a horrible time in math, in high school math. Um, options would be to move away from that subject area, find out what his or her strengths are, okay? Uh, maybe the, the struggle is social and there's like a mean group of kids. 
you can support your child to see that they have options at school. They really just need one or two friends. So who are the other people that they could be friends with? Maybe there's a group outside of school you can focus on, like a hockey team or a dance group or camp or something like that. Um, just make sure that there are options, that they see that they have options in whatever area they're struggling in. And um, I think just constantly loving and supporting your kids, being there, but showing them that you're confident in their ability to cope with whatever it is that's happening in their life. So it's really putting it back on them, right? Yeah. It's taking it away from us as the in charge, making the decisions, doing everything and just giving it back to them over and over again. Yeah, and sort of saying like, I'm here, I'm your home base. Think of that game, um, hide and go seek. You're the home base, you're unconditional, you're there. Yeah. You're encouraging them to go out and yeah. they can come back when they need to. Yeah. Whenever they want to. Yeah. But also modeling to them, like for example, if your child has an IEP, they need to ask for what they need and want. Absolutely. So, and some teachers aren't going to be offering the accommodations without reminders. So you say to them, this is what, let's talk about what you need. And you teach them how to ask for it when you're not around. Ask for it for themselves. Absolutely. Yeah. I love what you said too, about sometimes it means as parents that we have to like tolerate a little bit of it not being done perfectly. Like when you think of chores or even something like that, going to the school and asking for help in a way that you know, it, it's their way. So yeah. for me, the, the making of the meals, like when they're making meals and they're not quite cleaning it in the way that I would, do you know what I mean? Absolutely. <laughs> there's, there's a really letting go kind of thing to think yeah. this is good for the long run. This is not yeah. good necessarily in the short term because I'm frustrated, but in the long run, they're going to get it. Yeah, but the feedback, they need to get the feedback. Part of the whole helicopter parenting issue in the millennial kid is the self-esteem. Um, it was like a self-esteem thing that came out in the 80s. It's like the participation yeah. ribbon. Everybody got it. Nowadays, kids, they never get criticized about anything. That's not saying right. go out and criticize your kid. Yeah. But you could give them feedback because they're going to get it in life. And if they don't get it from mom and dad, they'll be shocked yes they'll get it from their first boss or something so if you don't like the way the kitchen is you say so just the same way as i very gently told my son yeah like that snow shoveling job was horrible <laughs> you <laughs> love it it was one of those strike days we yeah. did a really good job but it was like totally rotten yeah no Fair i do i do do enough. that mm -hmm. i do say okay let's come on back and continue yeah, back. continue what you started yeah yeah. They need feedback and because they need to learn how to not be always perfect in everybody's eyes. Yes. And this failure thing is huge. I think it's, it's so huge to be able to sit beside your child and just allow them to feel what's happened. That's not yeah. so great without trying to fix it. Yeah. It's hard. Really hard. Being cut from the team, not being picked for something, not being invited yeah. You no, know, maybe having to miss an event that's really fun because you've got a family commitment. There's yeah. a whole list of things that are rotten. Yes. And it's part of Yeah, and it's life. part of life. And the more they can learn to manage it, the more they're going to be able to launch, the more they're going to be able to look after themselves and be responsible. Yeah. yeah. I love it. Thank you, Jane. This is so helpful. Anything you would say to moms that are like struggling with it and saying, I don't want to let go. Um, baby steps. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's worth it. Absolutely. We yeah. Want kids who are high functioning, independent. Yes. Give them roots, but give them wings too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. To find balance. And, uh, I think, um, the teen years are so fun. It's so exciting for me to see my kids finding their way and figuring out what they're good at and what they like and some of the things that they want to do next. And, you know, it, it's scary sometimes the things that they're doing, but it's really exciting too. Yeah. Very it's, exciting for them. It gives me shivers sometimes. It gives you what? Shivers. It gives me shivers. shivers. Oh. I get that sort of feeling. Yeah, totally. 
And that to me is wonderful because we often, like even people, you know, that have younger children often are dreading their teenage years, right? Because of what we've been told. Yeah. Yeah. I think the teen years get a bad rap. Personally, I didn't love the toddler stage. That was my least favorite. And I think that after you get to about three and a half of your baby, whoever your baby is, when they're three and a half, your life starts. That's my thing. Yes. And then um, there's a hard year per child somewhere between grade six and grade 10. Yeah. Outside of that, I think it's pretty good. That's amazing. Thank you. So if people want to get in touch with you, where, where can they find you? I am on um, LinkedIn, Jane Christoffi. I'm on Instagram. I have a fun Instagram um, platform. It's Jane underscore right track. Jane underscore right underscore track. I should probably change that handle. To make <laughs> no, it's all good. And then um, righttrackeducation.ca is my website. Perfect. If anyone wants to connect to see if I've got something that, you know, they, they can get some boost from, I've got lots of services. So check out my site. Give me a call. Give me an email. Thank you. That's Thanks. super helpful. And I certainly um, called on Jane's help when I was changing schools for my kids when I moved from Toronto up to uh, Richmond Hill. And I had, you know, kids with certain needs and I wanted to make sure that I knew what I needed to do to support them. So thank you for that. And thank you for um, sharing about your own, you know, journey in parenting your kids. It's super helpful. Thanks, Carolyn. Have a great day. Thank you.